Thank you, Stephen. That guy sounds great. I'd like to meet him. He's a <laughs> Sounds fantastic. Well, it's, um, as ever, it's just been a wonderful experience for me, jetting in and jetting out. Um, um, but you've, you've, as you always do, you've made me feel so extraordinarily welcome. And I've, um, I've learned so much from you. And I congratulate you beyond measure for the quality of the event and the participation. It's, uh, it's truly extraordinary. So well done. <laughs> Um, what, what is the, is, and of course it's a great privilege to be the final um, plenary speaker, thank you for that, but uh, what is the job of the final plenary speaker? Well usually it's to keep people captive because they've promised the exhibitors that people will stay till three o'clock. So that, but they're all packing up over there so that can't be it. So um, I, I think my job is to help us together to collect up the energy and the wisdom and the information uh, and the new knowledge that we've all gained through this two days and be ready to project in a focused way that back into the, the real world. And I've, I'm going to use the image of an arrow. I want you to think of yourself as an arrow. And all the sessions you've been in and the conversations you've had have loaded you up. The bowstring has been pulled back with potential energy. I guess you're all feeling loaded up with ideas and energy and you're about to fire back into your place of work to take that back. And of course, as you look around the room, it's not just one arrow, it's a collection of people across the province and more widely, including me, who are going to take what we've learned and what we've shared and fire it back. It's a wonderful image, this idea of what in the medieval war they would call an arrow shower. There's a, a fantastic poem written by the English poet Philip Larkin called The Wits and Weddings that he finishes with this line, an arrow shower sent out of sight somewhere becoming rain. It's beautiful, isn't it? And uh, I want you to think of yourself like that, a shower of arrows and then land and nourishing the land with uh, fresh rain. But uh, maybe when you go back, it turns out that the people you're working with aren't as excited as you <laughs> about what you've learned. They haven't kind of shared the experience. Maybe some of them are even waiting for you to come back to kind of point out that it's still the same. And holding on to that energy as you go back and land, carrying it through against all the challenges of change is going to be a really great, really great challenge. And I, I, that's my job, for us together to think about what we can hold on to so that we keep that energy and we follow it through to make the difference you want. And I'm going to try and um, connect us to some things that I help, hope uh, help you do that. And the first is to talk about purpose, to remind you that this isn't a great conference of people thinking about um, cars or uh, hotels. It's about healthcare. It's about this extraordinarily important national civic resource in our society, a keystone in British Columbia as it is in the UK of what it means um, to be our society, this thing that we provide for our community that matters so much to them. So there's deep purpose to what you're doing. What we do in this room is important. And so doing it well, the task of quality improvement, is really important. And in addition to the day-to-day, -day, we have a generational responsibility. Sustaining what we do is vital. We are the inheritors of people who worked hard in our two countries to establish the idea of a universal healthcare system, to create something that didn't exist before, didn't exist for our grandparents and some of our parents. Not every country was able to create that. In some countries it's still, and some quite near to you, it's still not possible for people to enjoy the benefit of dealing with illness without fear of losing their livelihood. These are remarkable social creations. We are the inheritors of that. We are the stewards of it for now. And in my view, we have a responsibility not just to do well today, but to make sure that we can hand that on for the future. We're not the last generation. My, my daughter at school was encouraged by her teachers to write an essay. Um, I, this isn't the correct title, um, but it, the, the emphasis was kind of what of your parents um, peed up against the wall that you won't have for the future. It was kind of the emphasis. What have they wasted? Environmental issues. For us, we used to offer free university education, um, and we, we don't. A whole range of things that our generation has kind of used up 
and isn't available to my daughter's generation. Uh, and I'm, I'm personally absolutely determined that healthcare, free healthcare, universal healthcare is not on that list. That we are not the generation who used that up uh, and stopped it being available. And yet we, we could be. So purpose handing over is really important. We tried in England to get back to discuss discussing purpose, to being clear what it meant. Because in healthcare, uh, because everybody assumes we get what a great thing uh, doing medicine is, we don't talk about it very much. But when you're leading change, particularly difficult change, you have to go back to talk about purpose. And we set out what we thought ours was. And as I've done for you, a number of you before, I'm going to read it out to you. And I'm going to change the words a little so it's less NHS specific, because I think it applies um, to you as much as it does to us. This is the, the front of the National Health Service Constitution, our deal with our people. I'm going to change it a little. Healthcare in our countries belongs to our people. It's there to improve our health and well-being, supporting us to keep mentally and physically well, to get better when we are ill, and when we cannot fully recover, to stay as well as we can to the end of our lives. It works at the limits of science, bringing the highest levels of human knowledge and skill to save lives and improve health. It touches our lives at times of basic human need when care and compassion are what matter most. That's what you're responsible for in your communities. Can you imagine anything deeper and more important as a sense of mission um, to carry forward? So as the arrow goes back and as it encounters difficult winds and unwelcome landing places, the purpose of what you've learned is to apply it to protect that core purpose. So I want to talk a little bit about these four things. I want to explain a little bit more about why I think it's given to us to be a generation of leaders um, who have to sustain our healthcare system. I want to say something about what we do and just add and contextualize some of the learning that you've had in these two days. I want to talk to you as a community of improvement leaders. And I profoundly believe that quality improvement is the key tool to unlock this challenge. But I believe that we need to be honest with ourselves about upping our game as improvement leaders to improve that. I want to say something about that. And finally, I want to talk to you as healthcare leaders, as individuals who lead healthcare uh, and what it means to be that leader and how we can improve ourselves to take on this challenge. So let me start by saying that we are a generation who are called to lead significant change. Um, we don't get a choice. It's not really down to us. We just happen to be around and the stewards of our systems at a time when it's imperative that we lead change. And it's to do with quality, but more importantly, it's to do with something that people don't like talking about, which is money. We're a, we're a group of healthcare leaders who stand on the brink of revolutions in these two things, in uh, how we change the costs in healthcare and how we continue to drive quality, and how we do those two things together. We're the people who love healthcare. You all feel passionate about it. The way we, one of the ways that we express that, certainly one of the ways that I expressed it for my whole uh, professional life up to the last uh, seven or eight years, was saying healthcare is so important that we need more money to fund it. I spent so much of my life finding out where money was so that I could persuade people, uh, uh, local payers, governments, that they needed to put more money into healthcare because it really mattered. But I want to suggest to you that that well-intentioned act that was a big part of my career and I think has been a part of many of yours, turns out had in it the seeds of the destruction of our healthcare system. That by showing love for healthcare, by saying, give me more, give me more resources, I was inevitably part of a silent conspiracy to destroy our healthcare system. This is um, a graph of the cost of healthcare, um, the growth rate of the cost of healthcare compared to GDP, the gross domestic product, the wealth of our countries. Um, if healthcare costs were growing at the same rate 
as the wealth of our country, we'd be on the line. You can see that pretty much every country, yours and mine, is significantly above the line. It means that every year we're using slightly more of the wealth of our countries to fund our healthcare system. In fact, the cost of our healthcare systems is growing at about twice the rate of the wealth of our countries. So each year, you use a little bit more of the wealth of British Columbia, we use a little bit more of the wealth of the UK for our healthcare system. That's why healthcare grows to consume 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 percent of the wealth of your countries and heading north. It's a simple, straightforward fact to say that that's unsustainable. It's unsustainable. That's not an opinion. That's factually, mathematically correct. We cannot go on into the future expecting that we can consume more and more of the wealth of our country. You cannot consume 50% of the wealth of BC on healthcare because you've got education systems to run and military services and roads to support, all the other necessary things that are part of society. But if we carry on growing the cost of healthcare as we are, then sometime, almost certainly in your lifetime, and with absolute certainty in the middle age of your kids, we'll have broken our healthcare system. We will have been the generation that used it up, raised its costs, and made sure that the thing that we value so much won't be available for the future. We, the people who love healthcare, are creating the situation where we will destroy it. And we are the generation who have to make the change. Um, but, uh, it's, not even a, a simp it's not even just as blank as that. Not only are we uh, destroying healthcare, Healthcare is destroying economies. Just look at the US, the impact of the US of the cost of healthcare system. This is a particularly complex graph and almost impossible to interpret, particularly when I've forgotten to put on the uh, information. But it's, um, <laughs> but it's a graph. It's a graph from one of the rating agencies. I don't know whether uh, you're one of the last countries in the world with a AAA rating. It's fantastic. Well done. We were downgraded. Um, earlier this week. I can afford even less now uh, in Canada as the pound, uh, the pound slumped again um, against the dollar. Um, but this uh, uh, Standard & Poor give ratings to countries and this is a graph of what will happen in their view to the ratings of countries' economies if the cost of older people, and that significantly driven by older care but in this graph includes some other factors, if those costs continue to rise. The AAA ratings are the ones uh, in orange at the bottom. And what you can see is that all countries' economies gradually get more, um, less and less creditworthy because of the path we're on. There are almost no AAA rated countries by uh, 2030 because of the growing cost that we, the people who love healthcare, are imposing. We're destroying our system and we're also undermining our economies. In England, um, it's really obvious. We had a big crisis when the economy went bust. All our banks went south. We piled a lot of money in, and that money came from other costs. And so it was really obvious to us that we had a crisis. We were forced to take action because healthcare costs, initially for four years, and now it looks for nearer 10, were frozen. Healthcare costs were frozen. Um, and you know as well as I do that if you keep the money in healthcare the same and the population keeps growing older and we develop new capability, a gap opens up, and this was the famous. 20 billion um, gap. But it was really obvious to us. In some ways, I think we were very lucky to have that crisis because it brought home to us the scale of the problem. It forced us to act. Whereas for you, wonderful um, colleagues in BC, let me tell you the deep problem remains the same for you. The deep problem remains the same, but your crisis is less marked. And so the risk for you, it's not that you can avoid it, the risk for you is that you're sleepwalking towards this end. You don't have to deal with it this year. You don't have to deal with it next year. I know you'll have financial crisis, but you can figure your way through uh, the shortage of money this year, next year, the year after. But each year you choose to do that, you're choosing to load the problem up for the future. Uh, and one of the reasons I'm telling you this is because I think if you choose to do it, you should choose it willfully. Um, and if you don't, knowing this knowledge, you should decide with me that you're going to change it. And be the generation that starts to change the relationship between cost and quality in healthcare so that you become a generation that's starting to protect it for you and your kids and your grandkids. It's like, um, it's like environmentalism. You know, people who started talking in the 70s 
about sustainability, about the, the need for the world to think about sustainability, were crazy people. They were regarded as mavericks and nonsense. When you start talking about this in healthcare, you're often regarded today as crazy because what we need today is more money. Of course we need more resources. Come and walk around my hospital. Come and walk around my ward. But those people in environmentalism, of course, today are the mainstream. Everybody understands that to sustain the great good of energy in our society, in a healthy planet, we need to think about the long term. And we need to create that change in healthcare and recognize that just arguing for more is a path to destruction. And we have to be the generation that switches our mindset and begins to change the relationship. But today, uh, we have two strategies for dealing with it. One is that we put our hands over our ears and our hands over our eyes. And that's going on in a lot of places. In a lot of places. Um, and then there's the one on the right. I don't know if you can read that, uh, which it says, then a miracle occurs. In 19, um, 1992, I met the national leader of um, genetics in the UK, wonderful, wonderful man, who told me that I needn't worry about the future because genetics would have it all sorted in five years. Um, well, uh, it hasn't quite. Uh, I hope it does. I hope some fantastic revolutions come along that do solve this problem. That would be wonderful. But I'm not prepared to bet the future of our precious healthcare systems on a hope. Uh, and we have to do the work that begins to sustain it, while, of course, we continue to work on miracles. Um, so I want you to feel um, passionate about the task of changing the cost base of your society. I want you to feel passionate about it. Uh, people don't like feeling passionate about it. But if we are not the generation of healthcare leaders that begin to tackle the cost issue, we are putting at risk the future of our uh, system. It's really important. It's a massive ethical issue. Um, even when you do that, people will think you're a monster when you start talking about it. But you've got to do it. So that's the cost revolution. The second revolution is um, that you're all kind of obsessed about, like me, is the quality one. You've done a wonderful job here. We've learned from you as you've learned with us um, about how we can um, change quality. And I think we've, we've achieved one remarkable thing, which is that, if, that the public that we serve that previously probably tolerated significantly poor quality in our service are no longer prepared to accept it. It's partly the work you've done. It's partly about generational change in our societies. But that genie is out of the bottle and you can't squeeze it back in. And that's a good thing. In fact, that pressure for high quality, in my view, uh, is going to grow and grow and grow. It's going to cause us real headaches, and we should welcome those too, because they're forcing change. But if you think about our response to that, if you think about our response to it, and I'm, I've um, just enjoyed so much seeing the wonderful work you've done, but it reminds me of the work that we've done in England and the work that I see done in the US and the work that I see done in parts of Europe. It's fantastic individual examples of excellence. We, we can find in your country, in your province, in my country, and around the world, wonderful examples of the parts of what a great future healthcare system might be. But I really don't believe that we've generated this spreading fire of change, this um, unstoppable momentum. In fact, it feels to me, and I'm sure it does for you, that you just have to push and push and push relentlessly. There doesn't seem to be pull in the system for the great ideas. We have not yet created this self-improving industry. And that's the challenge that I think um, we really face. Um, it's also wonderful that in response to the problems we face, I think this is true for you, it's certainly true for us, that leaders and politicians in healthcare systems are turning to your skills. They're turning to quality improvement as the solution. Faced with the cost problem, they could easily just turn to stop things. We just can't offer the same deal to our people. We need to restrict access. We need to have fewer of everything. Instead, they're turning to saying, how can this community in this room today help us unlock this problem for the future? And if you believe what I say about the vital nature of the mission for the future, and if you believe what I say about turning to your skill set as the key part in that, then it makes the people in this room the most vital people in BC in terms of the future of uh, this critical institution. It is the people in this room, you are that generation of leaders on whom, we, uh, on whom this task rests. 
There isn't another room of people meeting somewhere else who are going to have as much potential influence as you at solving this problem. Um, and so you're charged with enormous uh, opportunity and enormous responsibility. But to do that, we have to have the honesty to reflect together on whether what we've done so far and the way we've done it, wonderful as it is, is enough to reach that mission. And I would suggest that we need to have massive ambition to improve our game as quality improvement leaders. Now, some of you will be um, um, listening to me, um, well, what would be the phrase, in, we'd use in England, bang on, um, about cost and quality. And if you're like most of us in healthcare, you'll be thinking, well, he's just, he's just talking nonsense. Because deep in our mindset, deep in our medical NHS healthcare mindset, is a belief that we were trained in very, very early on that quality costs. It's really deep in our psyche. Um, we've been trained to do it. We've been trained to find money and spend money. We've been trained that if we want better care, we've got to have more doctors, more nurses, new hospitals, more scanners. You need to fight for them. That's, that's our psyche. And when crazy people like me start talking about that our mission, our mission should be to drive quality up and cost down together, it just doesn't land in, in our heads or the colleagues around you or the people we serve. And in, in essence, people just don't believe it's possible. Um, but if you just spend a few minutes thinking about it, all of a sudden, that changes. This is a two by two. I said, I said in my workshop, this is very intellectually complicated. I'm sorry if you can't keep up. It's the sort of thing that us trained executives uh, uh, get to do. But for others of you, I know, <laughs> I know it's tough. It's a joke, by the way, just in case. Uh, English humor isn't quite working, but um, in the, um, you know, along the bottom, quality is improving, and uh, along the vertical axis, cost is going up. Now, to be honest, particularly at the start of my career, um, I spent my time just drifting along. I don't know if any of you are as old as me, you know, remember the kind of late 80s and the early 90s. Frankly, we didn't really have a toolkit for quality. We didn't think about it that much. Our job, our job in the National Health Service in England was described to me very powerfully by one of my early... Um, mentors was to say, your job is to keep the lid on. Just get through the day, get through the week. That's what we did. We drifted. I've also spent um, a lot of my career um, in these other two boxes. When money was around in the top right, um, I spent it. I'm really good at spending money. If you need, don't, don't hire me to do this. Just hi if you've got money, hire me to come and help you spend it. I'm, I'm great at it. That's what really what we did in that journey that Stephen was describing of the transformation of the NHS, the Blair government gave us a whole load of money and we used it to eliminate waiting time and tackle infection control and build new hospitals. We spent the money on great stuff. It wasn't a bad thing to do, but our training is where money's around, spend it. I'm equally good when money's not around at just cutting stuff. If the task in England was just to save 20 billion, it's not a difficult thing to do. Don't let anybody tell you that saving money is hard. It's the easiest thing in the world. You just stop stuff. You just stop hiring people. You stop training. Um, you end up uh, having uh, no uh, biscuits with the tea and coffee. Um, it's easy to save money. And so again, my honest reflection is that I spent quite a lot of my career oscillating between the two. And I think you'll see that too. Spend or stop spending. Spend or stop saving. And the question, therefore, if you believe what I'm saying, that we should be driving passionately with purpose for cost uh, reduction and quality improvement together is you have to move away from those things that we spent so much of our career doing and operate in that bottom right hand box um, and as I say people kind of their starting point is it's empty everything costs money but when you start to think about it um, when you start to think about your daily experience of working in your healthcare system you reach a different conclusion you reach a conclusion that the life of you and your colleagues around you is, do is dominated by waste and error and duplication and delay and failures in handover. Um, and you can find things that drive cost down and quality up together. Um, I've listed a few here. These are all incredibly obvious. Keeping people out of hospital. I watched um, my dear old dad in his last days um, just over a year ago after a long chronic disease. And he had the typical experience. At one level, he was really well cared for. But the last three years of his life were dominated by um, sitting at home, getting more and more unwell, 
with his chronic lung disease till he couldn't breathe, then being rushed into hospital, stabilized, and a couple of times picking up in a very vulnerable state uh, infections in hospital. Uh, and not the, not the end of his life he would have chosen. And as it happens as well, hugely expensive. Hugely expensive. It's kind of wrong on all fronts. Standardization, quite a difficult thing to say in healthcare. Difficult in the culture of medicine. Um, of course I want to be treated personally by a doctor who, when it's required, can choose to be creative and imaginative. But I must say I think that's a vanishingly small amount of time. And most of the time, I want to be treated by a doctor who's operating to well-established protocols using the best, uh, best evidence-based um, uh, procedures and materials on me. And we have to grow up. We have to grow up about standardization being right and a key part. Technology. I've had some great presentations. I think you're absolutely potentially world leaders in this part of the world in thinking about modern technologies um, in, um, uh, in changing healthcare. But most of us were trained to think that the computers made life worse. Best example of this was a doctor who wrote to me telling me um, that the um, computer system that he used in his outpatient clinic, because of all the security and the passwords, took him 12 minutes to log on each morning. And when we think about the um, requirement we have for efficiency in the UK, it's about 4% a year is what we have to deliver. That 12 minutes was two years' worth of efficiency for him to deliver because the damn thing wouldn't lo log on quickly enough. So our mindset about technology is in the wrong place. We don't add it in a way that drives both quality and uh, efficiency. Saving time. This one annoys people because everybody in healthcare, well, first of all, everybody in healthcare is a saint, basically. Um, and not just that, they're hard-working saints. They never stop. Um, so my experience is that most folks in healthcare work really hard. They work too hard. Working hard is not the same as using your time well. And people work hard incredibly wastefully. So most nurses are fantastic people. But the evidence shows us, the evidence from our work like yours in reducing um, uh, you know, the time to care work um, shows that nurses in England are typically wasting 30% of their professional time. If we needed to produce 15% more nurses, we've got more than double that locked up in the waste in current nursing time. We have to begin to unlock it. Harm. Harm is not only disastrous for the patient, it's not only a personal tragedy and disastrous, it also costs the infected patient, the patient with a um, bed sore. It's not just a personal disaster, it's spending money on creating a disaster. And doing the right things is cheaper. And the whole thing of reducing waste. Um, I don't know how many of you had the experience, I've um, had it a couple of times, of being in your own hospital or clinic as a patient. It's a pretty remarkable experience because you see a completely different facility to the one you do. I, I say to people, hospitals look different horizontally to they look vertically. They, they truly do. And all of a sudden, you stop seeing all these marvelous leadership initiatives about uh, lean. You start to see just crazy waste and handover and people walking down and picking up your notes and putting them down and handing them somewhere else uh, and the fourth time. When I was in hospital unwell, they were taking my damn blood every day for nine days. Uh, and I'd been relatively okay for five days, and they'd run out of places to take blood from, so they were starting to take it from more uncomfortable places, at which point I rebelled. And I said, look, you can start poking around in my ankles if you want, but only if someone can actually explain to me whether getting another normal blood result is doing anything for my treatment. In fact, it had nothing to do with it. It was just the system. The system was going to take my damn blood every day, even though it was normal. So my suggestion to you is that that magic box is actually jam-packed full of stuff, that we, if we were smart enough to do it, we could uh, apply things that begin to make that generational change that we need in terms of driving cost and quality together. We're a bit scared of it. We like talking about the quality side. It sounds kind of nice and warm and, and related to mission. And we get nervous about talking about the cold, hard language of the cost side. But the, the, the material exists if we believed it was our mission for us to do it. In case you don't believe me, um, go to the evidence. Evidence matters uh, to me, but it matters more to a lot of other people. Um, and the best study is John Overbright's um, study, which he's done three versions now, a meta-review of the evidence 
uh, on improving quality and saving money. It's uh, available amongst other places at the Health Organization, uh, Health, Health Foundation's uh, website, which I've referenced there. And he reaches the same conclusion that, of course, when you study the waste in our system, it's all there to be got out. Now, there is a really important caveat here, and this is where life gets tough for you folk. Some people will kind of take that um, section of my talk and say, yeah, I agree with him. So, um, driving quality saves money, and all we need to do is to drive for quality, and the money will fall out of the bottom. But that's not my belief. My belief is that driving for quality improvement generates the opportunity to save money, but you have to harvest that opportunity. This is like um, uh, my daughter when she goes shopping. Um, when my daughter goes shopping, and I, 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 I mean, I'm just completely lost with all this stuff, but she comes back and uh, she's got bags, which is always a really bad sign, and uh, I say, great, what's in the bag? She said, I've had a fantastic day. She said, uh, they had a 20% sale at um, uh, the shoe store, um, so I bought three pairs of shoes, and it was 30 pounds off each, so I've saved 90 pounds. <laughs> and I say, that's wonderful. Can I have the 90 pounds, please? and it's a little harder to hand over in cash. And that's the sort of argument that goes on. The, the way it plays in healthcare was people will say, we've introduced a fabulous pathway redesign in our orthopedic service. It saved uh, a day of care. A day cost $1,000. We've done that for 1,000 patients. That's a million dollars of saving. Well, no, it isn't. It's the opportunity for a million dollars of saving. And if you want to take that million dollars and use it to fund out of hospital care or a new drug regime, or something else that matters in your system, then you have to do the tough end of the business of harvesting that, that resource, which is people and facilities, and either taking the money or redeploying that to the service you're trying to create. There is a tough end to our business, and we improvement leaders have a track record of shying away from that tough business. We complain that finance directors uh, in our organizations don't trust us. One of the reasons they don't trust us is because our track record is talking about savings in the way my daughter talks about the money from her shoes. And we haven't built a strong enough reputation for being part of doing the difficult business of moving the money around the quality. And we have to get real and serious about that um, in order to fulfill the promise. I've talked about a generational change, about an idea of deep change going forwards. And I want to say something now that reinforces how profound and deep I think this change is. I think right now, most of us are involved in the kind of the first stage of this, which is um, redesign with inside the current kind of pathway. And it's great work. It's fantastic work. Some of you, I think, are moving on to the second stage, which is redesigning elements of the whole system, joining up bits of the system much better so that the patient flows. And I could, where you're doing that, I congratulate you because it's tough to do, but I've seen some of that happening, making connections between community services and hospital services um, so that the work flows. But I believe, and the evidence I think supports me, that if you, the, the, the kind of scale of change we need means that we need to begin now also think not just about change inside the current systems of care, but profoundly changing some of our systems of care. Moving from hospital to out of hospital, moving from sickness to health, beginning to move upstream and tackle some of those issues. We need to be generation, in addition to change inside the system, is advocating and delivering and passionate about a wholesale change in the system. If you look back at the work I led nationally in the UK, which I was very, in England, which I was very proud of, um, and if you want to know what really happened, then we had a study from the National Audit Office which reviewed the first three years of my work. Their whole intention was uh, to say it was uh, uh, not very good and they were forced through gritted teeth to say it had gone quite well, which is a great moment of pride for me. Um, but they also named something which I agree with, which is that we'd done really well on numbers one and two there, but that we hadn't made enough progress on the deeper change, on beginning to change the, the modalities of our system. And I'd encourage you to do that, but that's really tough. It's really tough for people to break out of their idea of what the system is, to see what it might be. Even though we see revolutionary change in the world of technology and social change around us, in healthcare, 
we're locked on very deeply to the idea of the hospital, to the idea of the current model of care. And we're very, very frightened. We find it very difficult when you talk to colleagues even to envisage that there might be other things as you move along that line. Here's what I mean. Some of you might have seen this before, but if, uh, so don't shout out and be pretend you're clever. Um, both of those contain exactly the same blocks. There's no trick in there. Exactly the same shape of, shape of blocks rearranged. There's no trick there. But when you rearrange them in that way, there's a hole in the bottom one. And yet, you know from your school days that the area of, of a triangle should just be the bottom multiplied by the top. So surely that should be the same. It's a conundrum. It's a complete conundrum. If you don't know the answer, I've had people sit and look at it for hours. I'm not going to do that now. Um, I'll tell you what the answer is, because the answer is informative. The answer is that neither of those shapes are triangles. If you look carefully at the top one, you might see where the red and the kind of turquoise one meet. It's slightly concave, very, very slightly concave, that line. It's not a straight line, that hypotenuse. And if you look at the bottom one, again, very, very subtly, where the turquoise and the red meet, it's very slightly convex. It's also not a straight line. The difference between those two is enough to explain the two. But the human brain is locked onto it being a triangle. One of the great successes of the human brain is uh, recognizing and locking onto patterns. And you, you'll find any number of reasons why that's not true, largely saying I'm a cheat, before you say they're not triangles. And we lock onto patterns as humans very strongly. And we're locked on to the pattern of healthcare. When you say to bright, young, engaged physicians that the pattern of care we need for the future is one in which we're not bringing people like Madeleine into hospital, we're supporting them to live lives. You're threatening a pattern that's as deeply embedded in their minds as those are triangles. You're saying it's not a triangle. And you have to go at it and at it and at it again and again. And it can feel really difficult to do. But I would remind you, certainly for us, and I'm sure for you, we have done this before. Think about the extraordinary change in care for people with mental health problems that happened in our society from the 50s and 60s to now. In England, what we did with people with uh, uh, mild, moderate and severe mental health issues in those years was we thought the caring and appropriate thing was to move them into huge warehouses outside of cities. And we thought that was great care. That was our triangle. That was our pattern. Today, those things are they're 40 or 50 years old, but they're, they're healthcare archaeology. They're gone. They're converted to housing estates and hotels because decisions were made by brave and courageous people to break the pattern. Um, I've, I've done something again that you shouldn't do in presentations and done a really long quote here. But this is a quote from the, a 1963 Minister of Health in our country um, who decided to lead this change. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually read it out to you, which is kind of a little bit tedious. But it's about mental health, and some of the language is very archaic on mental health, so I apologize if that's offensive to you. But as I read it out, I want you to think not about mental health, but about the other patterns of care that we need to change, about moving chronic disease out of hospital, about moving from sickness services to health services, and just replace those words, because I think it speaks to us in a really fresh way about uh, the kind of challenges we have, we have now. We have to strive to alter our whole mentality about hospitals and about mental hospitals especially. Hospital building is not like pyramid building. The erection of memorials to endure to a remote posterity. We have to get the idea into our heads that a hospital is a shell, a framework, however complex, to contain certain processes. And when the processes change or are superseded, then the shell must most probably be scrapped and the framework dismantled. I'll press on. He talks about resistance. This resistance to that change is not only physical. Hundreds of men and women, professional or voluntary, have given years, even lifetimes, to the service of a mental hospital or a group of mental hospitals. They've lo labored devotedly through years of scarcity and neglect to render the conditions in them more tolerable. And of late, they've seized with delight upon the new possibilities opening up and the new resources available for these old but somehow cherished institutions. From such bodies, it demands no mean moral effort to recognize that the institutions themselves are doomed. It would be more than flesh and blood to expect them to take the initiative in planning their own abolition. What a courageous political statement. How swimming against the tide. How, how much it was greeted with cynicism and rejection by professions and the public 
who thought that the right model of care, the triangle, was fixed. But we saw it through as a nation, and today no one, no one would go back to believing that the right thing for people like us when we were facing our mental health challenge in our lives was to lock us away in institutions. No one would return. We all now believe that the change was right, but it took extraordinary courage and commitment to break the pattern then. And I'm encouraging you to show the same uh, imagination and courage and to understand for the reasons set out in that speech that people will reject you not because they're bad, but because they've invested their lives in containing that pattern. But as we see it through and begin to break through, you'll have been responsible for remarkable societal change. Let me say something about you as quality improvement leaders and this task of upping our game to deliver this. I've set a very high bar for us in terms of what needs to be achieved. And wonderful as you are, and you truly are wonderful and extraordinary people, together we are currently not doing enough. Of course, you should be proud. You should be proud of what you're doing and proud of what you've, what you've seen here today. You're amongst the people in the world who are doing best in the journey to date. You should be proud. But the rate of change is not enough. I don't know wh wh what you think it is. Do you think we're sort of uh, moving on, along in a linear way that we just have to kind of keep at this for kind of 50 or 70 or 1,000 years uh, till everything's sorted? Uh, do you think it's gradually accelerating? Well, I don't know the detail of that, but I feel very powerfully that however wonderful our processes of change are, they are not moving as quickly as the problem is. The problem will overwhelm us unless we accelerate our capability for change. So you need to do something quite extraordinary, which is you need to apply improvement to yourselves. Um, I have to confess that I have found it in my career much easier to explain to other people how they need to do things better than I have to be better myself. I'm sure that none of that applies to you. Um, but you need to have the courage to protect what you've done, but be prepared to take it to the next level. We need to make improvements spread more quickly. We need to make it more sustainable. You, you must have the experience I've had that you can run an improvement project, and it's great. And then as soon as you move on somewhere else, it gradually sinks back to where it was. It's not sustaining in the way it needs to. We need to link quality and cost, and we need to change the culture. These are big tasks. We spent the whole of the workshop I was in um, uh, yesterday um, talking about the method that we've tried to use. And I mean, all I'm going to do here is to put this on the screen and say something very brief about it. But we've thought really deeply in England about what it means to try and accelerate our improvement. And what our conclusion is, has been is that we need to drive quality improvement methods along with a range of other seven other key things that together will accelerate our change. Um, that we need, um, as I tried to do at the beginning of this uh, talk, to be clear about purpose. That we, do, we need, as you already have, to have a change method and use it. That we need to tell the story and engage people over and over and over again in a professional way. That we need to support our work um, with evidence. That we need to set the system features, the way money flows, the way people get promoted, so that they're supporting the change, not subtracting from it. That we need to measure, and in a way that's quite challenging for colleagues in uh, Canada and BC, we need to be transparent about the measurements of quality across our system. In addition to caring and loving and bringing people on board through positive energy, we need also to hold people to account for delivery on change. I'm no longer prepared to sit in a meeting about safety where committed people say, we do care about this, but we haven't done the actions we committed to do last time. We have to get supportive and tough on delivery if we really care about it happening. And we need to recognize that for you and the people around you, this is a tough task, and we need to invest in your development. And we need to do all those things in a joined up way. For those of you who want to see more about that and the resources that we've put behind it, there's a, uh, a whole load of stuff on the uh, web under the, if you just Google NHS change model, that talks about this attempt to create an approach to change that we believe will improve improvement and allow us not just to run more and more projects. The solution to our problem is not running projects. It's creating an environment in which the projects seed a, a burning fire of change that, that uh, comes from them, which we create an environment in which there's unstoppable pull for change, not just relentless push at the level of projects. So. Um, we, as I say, we spent a couple of hours talking about this yesterday, and that's all I'm going to say, but do look at it. We think it's important, and I'd ask you to reflect on how it changes you 
uh, as a quality improver. And then I want to think about you as individual leaders and how we need to sustain and challenge ourselves to do this task. You are looked to by the people in your system as you're the arrow going back to your system. You are looked to as fundamental leaders in this process. And you have to um, frame and, and create yourself as someone capable of leading the scale of change that's required. And it's tough. I found it tough to do. I continue to find it difficult. It demands energy. Uh, it demands um, reflection on things I do less well. And I ask you to do the same reflection. There are some specific things to mention. The first um, of your jobs, and I, I, I want to encourage you to kind of with me to commit as you return to um, hold these ideas in your mind in taking forward the next phase of the work. And the first is that to be an improvement leader, you have to reject and be intolerant of mediocrity. Our, our system in England, I don't know what it's like for you, is pretty tolerant of doing just good enough. This is a graph of hospital mortality rates that's published every year. It could be almost anything, but when people see distributions of performance and they're in the middle of the table, in England, too many people kind of go, well, that's okay. It would be nice to be at the top, but we're not. At least we're not at the bottom. Um, people were quite sympathetic with you if you, make a re if you um, are complicit with your colleagues in accepting being in the middle. If you uh, have a conversation with your colleagues where you say it would be nice to be at the top, but we've worked really hard and we're only in the middle, people will think you're a nice person. They think you're understand and sympathetic, but you're not being a leader of the change that we describe. To be the leader of that change, you have to look at those distributions and say, however difficult it's been, we cannot be satisfied. Our mission of care and the relief of suffering and the sustainability of our services means that we cannot be satisfied with that position and we have to push harder. We have to reflect and start again and do the work and run the processes of change again because we're going to make it better. And when you say that, the initial reaction from your colleagues will not be to welcome that message. Again, as the leader of change, you're saying the uncomfortable truth um, that people initially don't want to hear. When you've been successful, when you've raised the bar, then you will generate uh, much deeper satisfaction in those colleagues in their workplace. But the task of the leader of the change demands that you are not immediately popular all the way through that process. And that's why people will describe it as lonely and difficult. If you don't get pushback in leading your change, in my view, you are not trying hard enough. You're not pushing for results. Use some of that negative energy to remind you that you're the person who's really pushing for the mission that matters. Because it's almost a diagnostic tool that when you're, when you're getting those reactions, it means um, that you're making the difference. But please have in your mind that you're going to be the person who rejects mediocrity. Be the champion of spread. Be the champion of spread. It, uh, it, if we could just take, if you could just take one idea, if you could commit today in this session to take one idea that you've been passionate about and relentlessly make it happen in your part of the world, then we would have achieved from these two days a huge acceleration of the process of change in our system. And even that sounds easy, is tough to do because we're deeply resistant to the adoption of ideas in our system. Um, uh, relentlessly I tell this story, but this is the story of me seeing, going on a, a leadership program, which I went on, a wonderful program, um, and uh, the reason it was a fantastic leadership program was a mix of people from all different industries learning about leadership together. It was very rich, and it was particularly exciting uh, because we found out that one of the people on the program was a spy. Uh, it was a very, very exciting um, um, thing. And uh, just like um, Sean Connery there, uh, we found out he was a spy when he got drunk, when he was having a drink. <laughs> and um, uh, he'd been, so this was a guy who'd been a proper, proper, your actual spy working for MI6, uh, uh, secret intelligence overseas, working in the Far East. And, uh, but he explained that when you're a frontline spy, you actually don't get it to do it for that long usually because people figure out who you are and you just become less useful. So he'd gone on from being a spy and he'd taken his um, knowledge and he was working in the... Um, um, electronics industry, one of the big global electronics, electronics uh, multinationals, running their multi-million dollar counter-industrial espionage department, using his skills to stop people 
stealing processes uh, about how to make microprocessors better. At that time, I was a board member of something called the Modernization Agency, kind of the equivalent of the council. Uh, and I said to him, it's really interesting. I've got a multi-million pound organization trying to give secrets away of how to make processes better, to give them away. And nobody wants to know. <laughs> so, I mean, I tell the story um, because it's funny and it makes us laugh. Um, but actually, it's a complete disgrace. It's a complete disgrace. Um, we go around telling people that we're passionate about healthcare, but not passionate enough to learn from anybody else. That's the truth of it. That's the truth of it. If you go to a conference in England, and someone at the, fr and someone at the front is presenting some great piece of practice, the people on the back row will be having a conversation that says something like, it's not that great. I, I know someone who works there. Trust me, it doesn't really work like that. Uh, they can only do it because they've got more money than us. It's a disgraceful attitude that I have had. And I encourage you to do a simple thing, which is to get over it. And to demonstrate personally your hunger for learning and adoption. Take something back from today. Take something from your neighbor and learn from it. Share something with your neighbor. If you really want to show how powerful it is, make something spread across a corridor in your own institution. But do it and change the culture of sharing and spread. And finally, I want to say something about uh, a third deep change in leadership culture that I want you to be the personal leader of as you go back as this arrow. Um, and it's about um, valuing the routine, loving the routine. This is a photograph of the hospital I used to run the morning after we had a huge hospital fire. That's uh, my uh, wonderful colleague, uh, uh, Mike Proctor. And uh, uh, what happened was, this was in York Hospital, a patient well known to us actually with drink and uh, uh, drug problems, admitted to the emergency uh, room late one night, query overdose, and we brought him into the hospital um, uh, for observation. And he came around in the uh, early hours of the morning, pretty psychotic, and set fire to the linen store uh, in the hospital. He burnt the whole of the third floor of the hospital out, it looked like that. Um, and we had to evacuate 120 patients in the middle of the night. It's very, very frightening. My phone went at about 3 a.m. It was the hospital to say, we're, we're so sorry to uh, disturb you this time of the night, Mr. Easton, but the hospital's on fire. Um, <laughs> do you want to come in? And I said, yes, I thought I would. <laughs> and. Uh, and uh, I, was in, uh, I was in full chief executive mode. It was a crisis. What was needed was the chief executive to arrive. I arrived, I started giving instructions. We had staff who had evacuated all the patients and I started telling people what to do. And I was completely irrelevant, completely irrelevant. Uh, 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 the colleagues in the hospital that day and the following two days achieved just unbelievable miracles. We created new ward environments. We comforted distressed pay patients and their relatives. We uh, created whole new areas of the hospital to care for work. People were extraordinary. The, the staff of York Hospital in that crisis responded just with just almost unbelievable excellence. Truth is, whenever I see some terrible incident uh, uh, to which healthcare staff are responding, a big accident or, Lord help us, some kind of terrorist incident, I never worry how healthcare staff are going to respond. They're always fantastic in crisis. That's true, isn't it? Fantastic. I'd go a bit further, which is to say that we love crisis, that we're addicted to it. We give great value to it. We love it so much that if we haven't got one, we'll make one. What we do in healthcare is we give value to the rescue. That's what we do. Listen to staff talking. They'll, as they come off shift, they'll say, oh, it's been a terrible day. We didn't have enough staff. You know, so-and-so didn't arrive. It's all been difficult. But we got through. People love the heroic rescue. And the problem with the work you're doing, quality improvement, is that what it creates is calm, ordered, routine care. When you're a patient, it's what you desperately want. You want calm, ordered, routine care. Especially, by the way, when you're an emergency patient, you want that. But we give value to the crisis, to the rescue. And the other thing I want you to go away and work harder is giving value to routine. Giving value to it. Do it by counting the number of days since the last incident and praising that more highly than you praise 
other things. Do it by consciously going out and saying to people what a difference it makes. Do it by measuring the experience of patients and how much they value it when it works. But we have to, as improvement leaders, swift the, shift the culture to one where medicine is a heroic, chaotic profession, to one where what is valued is calm, and you other people are going to do that. So I've, I've tried to set out something which I believe in passionately, that this, the purpose of this conference for you and for me is not just to be interesting and rewarding. It's not even to give you an idea to take back for the next stage in your journey, but it's part of something that matters incredibly deeply, which is that you, like me, have a generational responsibility to work to save and protect the most valuable social institution in your society. That's what I believe. Um, and I'm encouraging you to think about it. I'm going to go back from here uh, tomorrow, tonight, or to, I have no idea what day I'm in, but I'm going to go back from here at some point, yet I don't understand. I'm going to return to the place I live, which is uh, the wonderful city of York. And York's a wonderful historical city. But one of the reasons it's wonderfully uh, historic, it's got quite a lot of the history of medicine in. So as you work from the top left, the top left are the remains of St. Leonard's Hospital in York, built in the 1200s, the, probably the largest medieval hospital in Europe that we know about. People were treated by monks with prayer and diet. It's really interesting, isn't it? I think we could do with a bit more of the latter, actually, in some of our, some of our treatment. Um, the middle hospital is the, um, England's first ever built uh, mental hospital, purpose-built mental hospital, built in 1776 um, uh, in Bootham to, to house patients. Uh, in, when they were clearing the bottom of that, they found chains, manacles. That's what that treatment was. And the third one is the hospital I used to run, built in the 60s. And you can see that these were people who did those things who led generational change in healthcare. They, they lived at moments when it was necessary in their society to do it. And I'm encouraging you to understand that you are that generation. So take everything you've learned from this. It's been a wonderful, wonderful event. As you're that arrow returning, go back, knowing that you, as you're going to go problems, knowing that your mission is hugely important, uh, that you've got the generational responsibility to lead and sustain the future of the most important institution in the place in which you live. And I just wish you, with great confidence, huge, huge success in doing that for the future. Thanks very much indeed for listening.